We invite you to open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, or chapter 1, at the end, and then going into chapter 2, we finished with the last statement of chapter 1, that they glorified God in the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 2, a book which is dealing with the subject of the true gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You'll find notes in your bulletin. We urge you to follow along with us as we study God's Word. So far, we have noticed from verse 5 on, the first five verses being introduction, a matter of the defense of the true gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this defense, we have looked at the following points so far. In verses 6 to 9, we've examined the amazement of Paul over their condition. As he realized they had departed from the true gospel, they had added to it a gospel of works. We discussed three errors in Galatian churches, three errors that are still with us today. One is legalism. Now, pure legalism in the word of God is when a man thinks that he can be saved by his works. It is not dealing with the Christian problem. It is dealing with the problem of the non-Christian who believes that by his efforts and his good works he can be saved. That's pure legalism. There's also the problem of false liberty. When an individual comes to understand the pure grace of our Lord and the freedom we have in the Lord, he often falls into the trap of arguing that therefore we can do whatever we want to and his liberty becomes a license to sin. The third error is Galatianism, which is an error of the believers. Believers who do not any longer follow the principles of faith which cause them to once believe in Christ. They now assume that it is by works of the law that they are growing in the Lord. And Paul makes that clear in the crux of this book in Galatians 3, that we do not grow in the Lord, we do not uh, progress in our lives spiritually by the works of the law, but by hearing of faith, exactly the way we believed in the Lord Jesus. We're beginning at chapter 2 tonight, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10, in which we see this great confrontation in Jerusalem between the Apostle Paul, Barnabas, and an associate named Titus, and the Jerusalem leaders. Chapter 2, verse 1. Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them who were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in secretly to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person." For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the circumcision, uncircumcision, was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was diligent to do. After Paul had discussed his authority in their company, which we had in the last part of chapter 1, He begins with the attitude of Jerusalem leaders, bringing us to a great confrontation that he not only had in Jerusalem, but he later had with Peter, which we will get into next Sunday night. Peter, it appears, in spite of his greatness and his authority and his apostleship, had slipped into this problem of Galatianism. He had become very legalistic and applied the principles in such a way to hurt the believers. And Paul had to directly confront him with this matter. And so he begins preparing the way by discussing the attitude of Jerusalem leaders when he came down to them on a second visit. Now, there's a great question, and we've indicated this in your notes. There's a great, great question as to when this happened in chapter 2. 
Was it the situation in Acts 15, which was called the Council of Jerusalem, which was also a problem that originated in Antioch? And they brought before the Council of Antioch the problem of Gentile believers who are now asked to do certain things that the Jews did. And should we make these binding upon them? And a great council convened at Jerusalem over this matter. Some believe that Paul is referring to that. In fact, probably the most common belief is that Paul is referring to that in Acts 15. I do not believe that. I believe he's referring to his famine trip. You remember according to Acts chapter 11 at the end of that, after Barnabas and Saul had taught for a year in Antioch, the apostle Paul came with Barnabas to Jerusalem with relief money that had been gathered by the churches of Antioch and of Galatia. He had gathered this money together and brought it down to Jerusalem for the poor in Jerusalem. It is at that time that we have the story of the situation of Acts 2. And I'd like to quickly give you, which is indicated on your notes, seven reasons why this is the famine trip mentioned in Acts 11 and 12 and not the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. Number one, clearly this is Paul's second visit. When you look at chapter 2, verse 1, Paul said, Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Back to chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Then after three years, after he was saved, after he came to know Christ, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. Stayed 15 days, didn't see any of the other apostles, and then came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. They actually sent Paul out of their midst. They were worried about him. He who persecuted the church, now advocating Christianity, and possibly persecution would come to him. They sent him back home to Tarsus. Later, Barnabas went and got him out of Tarsus and brought him to Antioch. His second visit is the one described in Galatians 2.1. That is not true of the one in Acts 15. Secondly, both of these describe the trip to Jerusalem and that both of them were initiated from Antioch. People say, well, this couldn't be it because the famine trip would not have the same situation. But if you'll read Acts 11 and 12 carefully, you'll find out that that famine trip was initiated by the church in Antioch. Both trips were the same. To Jerusalem, both initiated from the same place, Antioch. Now, number three, another reason why this can be the famine trip and not Acts 15 is because the same persons are involved. Barnabas and Saul, they're not two different people, just the same. These are the only two apostles. On this occasion, they bring Titus with them. The fourth reason is that in this passage of Scripture in Galatians 2, there is no authoritative answer, as you find in Acts 15. In Acts 15, the church at Jerusalem gives an authoritative answer to the problem which was brought before them regarding legalism. Here, there is no thing like that. All they asked Paul to do was remember the poor. That's all they said to him. Now, the fifth thing is that the second visit, according to Paul, was by divine revelation. You read in chapter 2, verse 2, he says, I went up to uh, Jerusalem by rev revelation. I went up by revelation. God revealed it unto him that he should go. That is not true of the Acts 15 visit. The sixth thing is that according to this passage, there's a private discussion going on. In Acts 15, it is public before the whole church. Here it's where the private leaders, not the whole church. And the seventh reason is very unlikely that Peter would have done what he did in Acts 2, or Galatians 2, verse 11 to 13. It is very unlikely if it happened after Acts 15, because he would have known what the decision was of the Jerusalem council in regard to eating with Gentiles. That was his problem. He was compromising when he went to Antioch, according to verses 11 and 13 of, Genesis, of Galatians 2. So these are the reasons. You say, well, all those reasons important to me? I think so when you understand the progress of the gospel and why he wrote Galatians. Galatians, I believe, is the first epistle that was written by the Apostle Paul. Not everyone believes that. But if you understand this to be the famine trip for the reasons I just gave you, then you understand it to be the first epistle that was written by the Apostle Paul. And it makes sense. 
because the Galatian churches were, were the ones that were on his first missionary journey. So the first letter ever written is Galatians, and that makes sense to me too, because the new converts had a great problem in dealing with what was evident to them in Judaism, Jewish believers still keeping Jews' religion, and the new Gentile converts were very confused about whether they should do this also. And the first book that comes off the press, as it were, naturally no press, as it came off and was circulated, dealt with the true gospel of Christ. So I firmly believe that Galatians, along with possibly Romans, are the two fundamental books that believers should begin with and understand. They, they are books that deal with doctrine that help you to understand the gospel of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now just a few points tonight that I'd like us to see. I notice in the bulletin it has emphasized two consecutive weeks that my sermon will be short tonight. I want you to know I have not agreed to that. I think my staff has done that to me. Amen. Okay, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. First of all, let's look at the reason for his visit according to the Word of God. The Bible tells us that he took Titus with him. Every now and then, you'll, you will see the names of men who are traveling with a missionary team. There is a process going on that is developing disciples. We have been teaching that on Wednesday nights here, showing how the Apostle Paul was developing disciples. And here is another case. Titus is along with him. Where did Titus come from? Well, we're not sure. Titus became a great evangelist, ministered on the island of Crete, and he later was sent to Yugoslavia. Titus was a tremendous evangelist, tremendous church planter. Where did he come from? Most believe that he must have come from Antioch because Paul and Barnabas have only been there a short while and now they're going down on the famine relief trip down to Jerusalem and Titus is along with them. It's interesting how God always puts people together to bring out issues. Titus is along and he's an issue right away because according to verse 3, he's a Greek. And Paul mentions that he was not compelled to be circumcised. And yet, they were constantly telling Gentiles they had to be. Why? Because the Jews' religion said that there were three absolutely essential facts for you to be an inheritor of the promise to Abraham, one of which was circumcision. If you were not circumcised, you could not participate in the promise. Paul later wrote about that in Romans 4 and spoke of being a Jew inwardly, not outwardly. And that's very important. So as Titus comes down, Paul points out in Galatians 2, he was a Greek, was never circumcised. Why didn't you get upset about him? If this was such a big deal. He's pointing out to these people in Galatia who now think that they should be circumcised, they should follow the Jewish belief. He points out to them that when he went on his second visit to Jerusalem, they didn't persuade Titus. As a matter of fact, the summary of these first ten verses is they stuck out their hands and said, Welcome, Brother Paul. So why now were the Christians condemning him? As a matter of fact, he had an uncircumcised Gentile with him on that visit named Titus, and no one asked that he be circumcised. So Paul is, in other words, saying, what's the big deal going on now? Why are you so concerned about this now? You are going to another gospel, which is not another. That's not the pure gospel of God's grace. Another of a different kind, not another of the same kind. Now, according to verse 2, it was by revelation. God wanted him to go, and that's obvious from what Galatians is all about. You can see the plan of God behind this. God sent him there under these circumstances to write the book of Galatians. But there's a second reason, we might call a secondary reason. In verse 2, he says that he was communicating unto them that gospel which he was preaching, but privately to them who were of reputation. Namely, if you look down in the text to verse 9, it would be James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars. Now that's not a sly remark. Paul isn't attacking them as though they were trying to be giants when they weren't. No, he's saying it appeared to me when I visited there that they were the leaders, the pillars of the church. And so he felt a secondary reason why he should go is because he was the one persecuting the church. 
He wanted to kill Peter, James, and John. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He did everything he could to wipe out Christianity. And now he really felt sincerely, honestly, that he needed to go in a kind but firm way and explain to them that God had chosen him to go to the Gentiles. So he was going to meet with them privately. And that was his main reason for going. Now the second thing I'd like you to notice in this passage, Paul indicates there were some false brethren there. Now there is a play on words here because the false brethren in Jerusalem were now evident in the Galatian churches, in Iconium, in Antioch of Pisidia, in Lystra and Derbe. They were going around doing their little dirty deeds there too. Paul met them first in Jerusalem and he mentions them in this book to show these Galatian converts that this isn't anything new. They were there in Jerusalem. False brethren, what are they like? Paul speaks, first of all, about their methods. If you look closely at verse 4, he said that false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in secretly to spy out our liberty, which we have in Jesus Christ. Secretly to spy out our liberty. What methods? Is this the, the body of Christ functioning? That's why Paul calls them false brothers. There are still those false brothers with us today, people, whether you realize it or not. People who want to impose legalistic standards upon the pure grace of our Lord Jesus, who say we must do this and avoid this in order to have freedom in Christ. We must be very careful. Sometimes they are secretly coming in to spy out the liberty of the believers and challenge them in what they're doing. I notice also he mentions their motive. Do you know what the real motive is of people? who are like this, according to verse 4, the last phrase, that they might bring us into bondage. Paul, who knew liberty in Christ, freedom in the Lord, says, now they want to bring me into bondage. And I say to you that anyone who imposes such standards upon the freedom we have in Christ will only bring us into bondage. We will be trapped by the standards which we try to keep and hope that we somehow are going to become more spiritual. It is not done that way. It is done by faith in Jesus Christ. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That is the only way it is done. And then he mentions the manner in which he responded to them. I like Paul. I've often thought that Paul and Peter, when they had the conflict in Galatians 2, it's kind of like two individuals with the same personality, meeting one another head on. Now when Paul first came to Jerusalem on his first visit, he spent 15 days talking to Peter. And I can imagine what that was like. Paul was the learner. He didn't know too much. And he listened to this man. He got all the instruction about what had happened at Pentecost, how the body of Christ was growing, and so forth. He probably shared with Peter some of the revelations he got out in the desert. And they began to chat and talk, and it was an exciting time, a wonderful time. Now he comes to the Jerusalem leaders, and Peter here again is very responsive to Paul. But in just a few days... Peter's going to wind up in Antioch, and Paul's going to have to confront him right to his face. And what is the problem? The problem is liberty. It's the issue of whether or not we will continue the Old Testament regulations or will continue to identify only with those who do. And he will attack Peter. But can't you imagine the confrontation? Peter, that great fisherman, strong because one time he pulled in a net with 153 fish in it. And anybody knows that would take a strong man. Always putting his foot in his mouth. Whatever he did, he did with all his heart, and I like that. Whenever he cried, he really cried. Says he wept bitterly. Whenever he got mad, he really got mad. He cursed, he swore, and said he never knew Christ. He did everything with all his heart. And it was he who stood on the day of Pentecost and said, What you hear is about Jesus Christ, the same one that you crucified and slain. He had the boldness to approach a crowd who just a few days before had crucified the Lord Jesus. And he had the boldness to approach them and say, you crucified him, you killed him, you you now must hear the message I'm telling you. You must repent and be saved. That was Peter. Paul the same way. Outstanding, educated mind. A thrilling individual from his background all the way through his life. But I doubt seriously that Paul could speak as well as Peter. Now, Peter did not have the fluent language. 
for Peter had not been trained in the rabbinical schools of his day. But the Bible says that when they beheld the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived they had been with Jesus. The Holy Spirit was using Peter, the rough fisherman. I don't think he all of a sudden became eloquent. That might be encouraging to some of you in your witnessing. He was bold, all right, but God was using Peter, just like he is. And when you read this in Galatians 2, you can understand the confrontation that happened. Bold, blunt Peter. Not refined, not polished, not educated, not eloquent. And face to face with Paul, who has a speech impediment. But bold in his declarations just as surely as Peter. But with that speech impediment, there was an educated mind with eloquent language and a man who could logically reason through the steps of the, uh, of the revelations he was receiving, and to share it with this man, Peter. You can imagine what went on. But one day they had to face each other. One man was wrong, and there was a great confrontation. But Paul's writing the first ten verses to tell us that when he first came to Peter, he saw him in the first 15 days of, of, of uh, Galatians chapter 1. Now he's saying that when I went to him, he gave me his right hand. He shook hands with me and said, Brother Paul, they were one together. So this issue of liberty and of bondage was very serious in the early church. It's still serious today. But it was serious in the leaders between Peter and Paul. Very serious. How did Paul respond to all this? Look what he says in verse 5. To whom we gave place by subjection to these false brothers who came in secretly, to destroy our liberty. We didn't yield to them, he says, not for an hour. The point is, not one minute did I give them any kind of help, any kind of encouragement. Why? That the truth of the gospel might continue with me, with you. What is the truth of the gospel? The truth is the truth he's dealing with in Galatians, and that's the liberty that is in the gospel, that the gospel sets men free, and we now live by faith, not by works. And that is the truth that is in the gospel, that he wants to remain with them, and he wouldn't for a minute yield or be in subjection to them. Now, I'd like you to notice in verse 6 to 8 the relationship he talks about in reference to Peter. In verse 6, he says, But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatever they were, it maketh no matter to me. Now, that sounds like a slap in the face. It really does. You know, whoever they are, I could care less. And really, that's just about the way it reads, whether it's Greek or English. The point that Paul is making is that men sometimes use their authority to impose upon the believers that which is not specifically taught in the Word. Have you noticed that ever going around today? Among believers, some can ride because of their knowledge, because of their understanding, and try to impose, sometimes upon innocent new converts, impose restrictions that have no biblical foundation. Try to teach them things they can't find in the Bible, and yet they keep asking why, but this person's an authority, they ought to know. Listen, if you can't find it in the Bible, you better cool it until God shows it to you. You better stay away from it until the Word of God makes it clear to you. Is the Bible backing it up, or isn't it? That's the big issue here. So Paul says, listen, I don't know what they were, but I know this, that God accepts no man, no man's person. So the first thing is as to acceptance of others. Paul is saying here something that every one of us need to learn. The important thing is not that other people accept you. The important thing is that God accepts you. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? We are going around trying to get other people to accept us and to believe what we say. But the important thing is, does God accept you? Paul knew that in his heart. And he could take a thousand rebuffs, a thousand insults, because of one thing. He knew that God had accepted him. And that's a thrilling thing to know and be assured of in your heart. He says in verse 6, the last part of it, for they who seem to be somewhat, that would be the pillars mentioned in verse 9, James, Cephas, and John, who seem to be pillars. Same phrase used there. Those who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Wouldn't you like to have been in on that conference? I don't know what went on there. Peter, James, and John got together with Paul, and they tried to... Now, Paul, you're getting a little excited about this liberty thing. Now, now it's not so bad that all these Gentile converts have to do what we Jews have done. After all, the temple is still here. We're still doing sacrifices in Jerusalem. It wasn't destroyed, by the way, until 70 A.D. Remember that. 
So what's so wrong with it all, Paul? I firmly believe that what happened in Galatians 2, chapter 2, in that conference is what eventually exploded into the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. This is where it started. And Paul says, those who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. They didn't bring forth any truth that would add to what God had already shown me. But they were trying. That's the indication. The second thing I want you to notice about his relationship to Peter, as well as to James and John, was the authority issue. Paul says in verse 7, but on the contrary, in opposition to what they tried to persuade me to do, on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me. You know, the only authority we have is the fact that the gospel has been committed unto us. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 that the word of reconciliation has been committed unto the believers. Where was it? From, from where did it come? It came from God. God committed it unto us. Therefore, we have authority. Authority because we are so important? No, but because the message came from God. And they recognized that what had happened to Paul, the message that he had received, was truly from the Lord. The third thing I noticed that he says regards approval. Every one of us want approval, and we should want it from God. And he says in verse 8, that he that wrought effectually in Peter, Paul recognized that, to the apostleship of the circumcision, to the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. God had blessed Paul just as surely with Gentiles as he had blessed Peter. Have you ever heard a description of Acts, and it usually goes something like this, the first few chapters are Peter, and the last few are Paul. And it appears when you study the Bible that Peter and Paul stand out as big guns. You know what I mean? Have you ever read the Bible and heard people talk about it, and it, it just seems like they are, and you ask why? Here's the answer. The early church recognized that apostleship to the Jews was given to Peter, that apostleship to the Gentiles was given to Paul. So Paul definitely, because of this, had an authoritative ministry in training and developing others. So did Peter. And they recognized that the two were not in conflict. And isn't it fascinating that Paul wrote later in 1 Corinthians 9, he said, to the Jews, I became a Jew. To the Gentiles, I became a Gentile. To the ones under the law, I became under the law. To the ones without the law, I was without the law. That to all men, by some means, by any means possible, that to all men I may somehow, what, save some. The beautiful thing here that's between the lines is that at this conference they recognized that the gospel was more powerful than the seeming limitations that people were putting on it, saying it's just for this group or just for that group. We do the same thing, just for a certain class of people. And we have a tendency to put limitations on the gospel. And what happened was a recognition the gospel was more powerful than the limitations that men put upon it. It had gone to the whole world, and that was exciting. And Paul himself, who was to the Gentiles, was probably one of the great servants to the Jews, one of the great ministers to the Jews. And he was to both. Why? So that he might win them both. Did he compromise? No. He was trying to win people to Christ, no matter whether they were Jew or Gentile. And he later taught that all were one in Jesus Christ. That's a marvelous truth. Then just two things at the end that I think are important in chapter 2. One is in verse 9, and that is the receiving of fellowship on the part of Paul and Barnabas by these three men. Let's look at it, verse 9. When James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the Gentiles and they unto the circumcision. Isn't that a beautiful thing? I don't know what all went on in chapter 2 in that conference. I don't know what all went on. I know later they had a big deal over it. But they had courage enough to sit down and put their right hand out and say, Paul, God bless you. God is leading you into an area that we just don't understand right now. But we praise the Lord for what he's doing. Can you imagine that scene? 
as those five men sat around and shook hands together and said, you know, we're one in the Lord. Let's receive each other. You come to Antioch, Barnabas and Saul and say, we'll show you what it's like. Great. Anytime you're in Jerusalem, you're welcome here. Great. Praise the Lord. You know, we often do get uptight about small things, don't we? People often impose upon people restrictions, even in coming into the fellowship of a local church. I thought here, as I saw this, the right hands of fellowship. Upon what is that based? Only two things that I know of in the Word of God. Additions to the fellowship of a church are upon two things. That's all there is. Those who have received the Word, you've got to be born again. You're going to hear that in song tonight. You've got to know Christ as your Savior and Lord. But secondly, baptism as a public testimony. Acts 2.41 says, They who have gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them 3,000 souls. How are people added? To whom do we extend the right hand of fellowship? Listen, ask no questions about age, society, culture, anything like that. Ask one question. Do you know the Lord? Have you been baptized in public testimony to him? Praise God. Here's the right hand of fellowship. You say, wait a minute, I'm a legalistic believer. Well, God will show you. Give me your hand. You got too much liberty for me. Well, give me your hand anyway. We'll, we'll get along. Praise the Lord. I don't like the way you do things. Well, that's all right. God bless you. You know the Lord and so do I. You understand that? That's one of the beautiful teachings right here in Galatians 2. Men, they just, they weren't settled here. Why, history records what happened. Acts 15, the confrontation in Antioch, but the right hand of fellowship was given. Why? Because they came to know the Lord and they'd been baptized. And within the context of a church that is teaching God's word, that's when views and problems and so forth are corrected by the power of the word. We are not here a refrigerator to preserve piety. We're like an incubator hatching out converts. We are people who gather together in a hospital and we're all sick and we're trying to get well through the power of the word of God. Let's recognize what we are. A fellowship of people who have grabbed hands, have joined together, said, God bless you, brother. We don't agree. We're not all the same, but we've come to know Christ. We've been baptized and so we've been added to the fellowship. And that's a great thing. The last thing they told him to do is remember the poor. Remember the poor. And Paul says, I was diligent to do that. He never forgot anybody. Don't ever isolate yourself from the needs of other believers. If we truly have accepted one another with the right hands of fellowship, then we must not isolate ourselves from one another's needs. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and We thank you for this problem given to us in Galatians 2. We know that if men would have wrote the Bible, they would have left this thing out. They wouldn't want to have talked about it. But you tell us things happened exactly the way they did, and you tell us the truth. These men didn't always agree, but they knew the essential truths. And you led them and continued to show them by your Holy Spirit what was the truth. We thank you for these men who were willing to submit themselves and humble themselves with one another. Thank you for this situation when Peter, James, and John extended the right hands of fellowship to Barnabas and Saul. What a great gathering that must have been. What a wonderful feeling must have been between them all. God, we pray that it would be the same here. We ask that those in our midst who really have never come to know Christ might understand that this is a fellowship in Jesus Christ to which we belong by faith. It's not entered any other way. Many of us have our names on church rolls that are a waste of time simply because we do not know the Savior in a personal way. We've not come to be born again and born into this fellowship of Christians. And Father, we do pray for those in our midst who have been born again. We pray, Father, you'll give us a great spirit of fellowship one with another that we might join together in a great effort to reach our world for Christ. Even though we don't agree on all aspects, help us, Father, to submit ourselves unto your word and continue to learn and to be teachable that God's power might be in our midst and the unity of the Spirit might be kept with great endeavor, great striving among all of us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.